Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Mason and let's hear some stories from Reddit. But before that, don't forget to press the like and subscribe so you won't miss any videos in the future. Or maybe leave a comment down below. That really helps the future of the channel and means so much to the effort that I put in every day. Now let's dive into the stories. First story, disclaimer. The original story got a bit more attention than I expected. So I need to change a couple of small details that don't affect the story. Some of the people involved use Reddit, and I'd like to skip the angry mob of villagers with torches and pitchforks. For Christmas every year our extended family tradition is that each small family group does presents. Stockings. Breakfast with the kids at home. Then we head to the grandparents' houses for the turkey dinner. Then, in the evening, all of those people head to my aunt's house for the big party with all the cousins. Plus her partner's side of the family. There are hundreds of us. Think of a swarm of locusts. One year, my mother called about a week beforehand to let me know of a change in plans. Instead of heading to my parents' house, we were going to go to Dark Helmets before the big do. I was not in favor of this arrangement, and bowed out gracefully. In the next few days, I underwent one of the biggest psychological assaults ever launched. I was ruining Christmas. It wasn't fair to make them choose between me and Dark Helmet. I was destroying my kids' relationships with family. It was such a small thing. If I didn't do it I'd be responsible for every bit of evil that exists. Blah blah blah. It was relentless, and I buckled on the 23 when they got to my kids, who told me that they really wanted to go. They were relieved, and started telling me all about their plans, none of which I cared about. But the highlight was going to be her normally shy husband's performance of his favorite song. Once he'd had a few drinks in him, you see, I'd be in for a real treat. The day of, we headed to their place. She was on her best behavior. She only had a problem with the way I cooked the ham I brought. How I'd worn my naturally curly hair curly. With how my outfits always consist of dark colours. With how I was wearing a sweater that showed too much cleavage. Even though I'm relatively flat-chested. And haven't even met my cleavage. With how I was wearing heels even though I'm already so much taller than her. How much more vain I am than she is. And a few more that I've forgotten. Before the food was an hour away from being ready. Dark Helmet's husband had consumed enough alcohol that he felt ready for the night's entertainment highlight. We all gathered around in the living room. Then he opened his mouth and completely botched the words. He even got the title wrong, and it was the most repeated word in the entire song. Think someone singing macaroni instead of macarena. I politely clapped with the rest of them and headed outside for some fresh air, hoping to avoid being asked for a critique. Dark Helmet cornered me just inside the door when I headed back inside. So what did you think of Jeffrey's performance? Not his real name. It was nice. I'm not familiar with that version. But he did a surprisingly good job. That's where I went wrong. What do you mean? That's the only version of the song. The version I heard was actual name of the song. She laughed at me and then went to make fun of me for it with everyone else in the house. How silly I was, trying to correct her husband on a song he's been singing for decades. Hilarious. They got such a kick out of proving me wrong. She kept harping on it. So when I finally got frustrated enough to throw caution to the wind I offered to bring it up on my phone. Guys, she forbade me to use my phone to do a search and bring up the video. Forbade me. I, of course, did it anyway, and then she tried to grab the phone out of my hand. We had a legit tussle in the hallway, and she started yelling. Everyone came running to see what I'd done to set her off, because that was the only reasonable conclusion. I told them that it was time for me to go and I just wanted to be left alone to gather my things and get the kids ready to go home. This was unacceptable, and I found myself surrounded by a coven of shrieking harpies, all intent on having their say. Her husband wanted an apology. My sister wanted me to just do it to keep the peace. My parents were off on a look what she's done now. Tangent, brother-in-law wanted me to show respect to his mother, and his inebriated brother just saw people in a confrontation and decided to just throw out random loud words in the same direction everyone else was facing. I managed to get all of my stuff together and got my kids dressed to go. That's when Dark Helmet decided to ban me from the super party later that night. I figured it would be best to skip it anyway, so no big loss. But then shit went sideways when she decided that she'd allow me to leave. But my kids had to stay. They were not going to let me ruin Christmas for my precious babies. They straight up backed me up through the door, then shut, locked it. I stayed outside on the lawn, in 3 feet of snow in minus 30 weather for about 15 minutes, weighing the pros and cons of calling the cops.
trying to stop myself from going nuclear. Luckily, a patrol car passed by so I flagged them down. They went to the door with me so that I could collect the kids and head home. No charges necessary. Luckily I had picked up the fixings for dinner already, so we still managed to have a decent Christmas when we got home. All things considered. Oh and I got to hear my daughter say mommy. I think Dark Helmet is bad fit insane. Second story, entitled mother tries to make my sill's life miserable in order to get a house. So this story requires a lot of background to be understood. So please bear with me. Recently, my mother-in-law passed away. My wife's sister, Lucy, 40 female, has a mental handicap where she has the mentality and maturity of about a nine-year-old. She has lived with her mother her entire life and was, understandably, devastated by the loss. Because of her handicap, Lucy receives a social security disability check every month from the government in the amount of about $800. She and my mother-in-law had been renting an apartment using both of their incomes. However, with the loss of my mother-in-law income, Lucy could no longer afford the apartment on her own. My mother-in-law and Lucy have a small dog, a Chihuahua Maria that they have had since it was born. Maria is now 12 years old. Lucy loves this little dog, and it is really the only thing she has left of her mother. My mother-in-law had taken care of Lucy for her whole life, to the point that Lucy never had to cook, clean, go grocery shopping, pay bills, make a budget, or do anything for herself. My mother-in-law passing was not a surprise. She had been sick for a while. Therefore, for the past year or so, Lucy has been receiving services from a state-sponsored program, GP, to help her learn life skills such as cooking and cleaning. This program also offers housing assistance, but it was not needed before this time. How the housing assistance works is that the GP buys or rents housing and then places clients in the house, charging the clients significantly reduced rent, with the state welfare program making up the difference. After my mother-in-law death, my wife became Lucy's power of attorney, allowing her to make financial and medical decisions for Lucy. My wife was able to get Lucy set up in GP housing at a cost to Lucy of $500 per month. This included all utilities, leaving Lucy $300 per month for internet, food, and anything else she needed. It's not ideal, but it's doable. However, she would be unable to keep the dog. The reason for this is M, whom we will call Karen, because, of course, also living in the same GP housing as Lucy, is Dottie, 20 seconds F. Dottie is also handicapped. She is non-verbal and walks with a walker. However, she seems very sweet. Unlike her mother, Karen, Dottie requires 24-7 support from caregivers. Lucy also has caregivers come in weekdays during the day to help her. Maria ended up staying with one of her caregivers, Sophie, until a situation could be arranged where she and Lucy could live together. Okay, enough background. Let's get to the entitlement. When my wife met with the GP representative and Karen to discuss Lucy moving into the house, Karen told everyone that dogs were not allowed because the landlord forbade it. The landlord she was referring to was not the GP, but the owner of the house that the GP was renting from. My wife asked if she could discuss this with the landlord directly, and Karen said, no, I'm representing the landlord, so you'll have to just trust me, it gets worse. Even though Lucy is technically renting from the GP, Karen insisted that my wife sign a sublease stating that we were renting from Karen. The representative from the GP said to go ahead and sign it, and that it would be fine. My guess is that, since Karen is paying the GP, the document would be unenforceable. And the GP rep just didn't want to deal with fighting Karen. So, my wife signed it. Karen also wanted Lucy to pay the $500 monthly to her, and she would give it to GP. My wife stood her ground on that one. There was no way that we were trusting this person with Lucy's money. After much arguing, Karen finally agreed to let us pay the rent directly to the GP. Then the discussion went back to the dock. My wife asked if there was any way that Maria could live with Lucy. Karen said, of course not. My husband is allergic to dogs, my wife said, so that means if your husband came to see Dottie, he'd have a problem, right? Karen replied, no, my husband never comes to the house, but I do all the time, and I can't be bringing dog dander home. Later, when my wife and I were at the house to sign the sublease, Karen mentioned that she had to leave to pick up her other daughter's dog. What? Karen also tried to get security cameras installed in the house. They would cover the living room, the kitchen, and the dining room, basically all of the common areas. Because Dottie was nonverbal, 
and couldn't tell Karen what was happening with her. She wanted to be able to observe what was going on in the house at any time. Nobody was okay with this. Not Lucy, not my wife, not the caregivers, and not the GP representative. Some of Dottie's caregivers told us that Karen had asked for this on multiple occasions. She didn't like being told no. So, Lucy moved in without the dog. Sophie would drive her over to her house nearly every day to spend time with Maria. Every time Karen came to the house, when Lucy was there, she told Lucy that she should just forget about the dog because she is never going to have Maria with her again. Everything having to do with Karen was starting to look a little fishy. Using public record search, I was able to determine that the owner of the house was an 80-year-old woman who inherited the house from her parents when they died. Using the same search, I was able to learn that Karen owned three different properties that she rented out. I kinda got the impression that Karen was trying to somehow get the house from the owner. But we never figured out what that dynamic was all about. After living there three months, my wife received a letter from the owner of the house. It was an eviction notice. Apparently, the owner had decided to sell the house, and Lucy had 30 days to move out. The letter also stated that Karen has decided not to renew the lease. My wife called Karen and, as it turns out, Karen got a similar letter from the owner stating that Lucy had decided not to renew the lease. I could not help but laugh. It seems that whatever Karen was trying to pull on the owner, the owner got the last laugh. A few weeks later, Lucy moved into another GP house. This one is more expensive, $600 per month, but it includes internet, which Lucy no longer has to pay for. So it's pretty much a wash. Also, another resident in the house has a dog. So, after making sure that Maria and the other dog got along, Lucy has her dog back. Last story, Em accused me of stealing from her child after he tried choking me. So this story happened quite a few years ago so I don't remember all the details and might make mistakes when telling it regarding to ages and stuff. Sorry in advance. So, when I was still in high school, I used to babysit and I found a job in my neighborhood babysitting the brother of a child with autism. The mom had a nanny for the autistic child, but needed help with the other child, since the dad always worked abroad and she had walk a d other things to do as well. When she told me about the job she explained that in general all I had to help him with simple stuff like playing with him and making him do his homework. The problem started with the pay I was receiving, only around $8 an hour, compared to the amount of work I actually had to do. I had to help him do his homework, more often than not, doing them myself. Whenever the child grew sick of doing his homework, the mom expected me to sit there and do them myself. I once had to write a few pages of essay for his stead while he was playing in his room. The M kept checking on me and wouldn't let me leave before the essay was done. Edit, some of you are saying, and I agree with you, that I should have left after the homework incident. But at the time I was naive and wanted money because I saved up for a goal. So I didn't want to give up that quickly and thought $8 is what I'm going to get no matter where I'll go anyway. But that was just an example and is not where the real problem started. A few weeks after I started working at their house, on my day off, my cousin was visiting me and we decided to go play basketball at the field near my house. This field is a communal field for the neighborhood and is located inside of a primary school near their gym. A common problem with this field is that a lot of times balls get stuck on a lowered roof of the gym. And the same thing happened to me and my cousin. So the story goes like this. In order to get our ball down my cousin had climbed onto the lowered roof, and what he found there was another really good soccer ball which probably got stuck there before. It was late in the evening so we were the only ones on the field at that time. As my cousin was rescuing the balls, from on top of the roof the child I was babysitting arrived at the field. Seeing what we were doing, once the child saw my cousin hand me a really good soccer ball from on top of the roof, he immediately ran and tried to snatch it off my hands, claiming he wanted that ball. I of course refused to give it to him. Me and my cousin wanted to play some soccer with that ball, but the kid wouldn't let us go. So what I suggested was that if he can make a goal while I'm the goalkeeper, he can have the ball for himself. He was an 11-year boy and I was a 16 or 17-year girl at the time. He had 8 tries. I was always a small child, only 1.45 meters tall at the time while this kid was almost as tall as me around 1.40. But I have always prided myself on my goalkeeping abilities and as such he didn't manage to make a goal. Seeing as he had lost, he went into rage as he climbed onto my back and tried to choke me. I couldn't release myself from his hold, and only my cousin, which was a lot bigger in size than both of us, managed to tear him off of me and the kid got scared and ran off. At the time I realized I can't babysit this kid anymore. But I did not think of calling his mom telling her what he had done. 
since he was just a kid. As I was catching my breath, and my cousin was taking care of me, I suddenly received a phone call. Apparently the kid has called his mom telling her what had happened, but portraying it as though he had found the ball first and we took it from him. As soon as I picked up the phone, I heard screamings from the other side telling me to give the ball back to the kid. As I assumed he didn't tell her the full story, I tried explaining what had happened and telling her that in fact we were the one that found the ball first. Had a fair competition even though we didn't have to. And when her kid had lost he tried to choke me. The mom told me that she didn't care what her child did. I have to give him the ball and apologize in front of him since I am bigger than him and he deserves to get the ball. Completely ignoring the fact that her child choked me, I of course refused to give the ball to her child, telling her I will no longer work at her home and hanging up the call. No longer feeling like playing, my cousin and I went back to my home. I live a 5 minutes walk away from the field, but not even half the way back I got another call from the mom. Thinking maybe she calmed down and wanted to apologize I picked up the phone. Again, as soon as I picked up the phone I hear screamings in my ears, telling me not to move since she is calling the police. I asked her why would she call the police. It was a kid's fight and her son was the one that did all the physical violence to me. She kept screaming so I hang up the phone. Arriving to the elevator, in my building I got another call. I didn't even answer this call. Immediately blocking it and entering the elevator. As soon as I got out of the elevator I got another call. This time I did answer. As soon as I answered it, again all I heard were screamings, telling me she was going to call the police on me, and also that she knew where I lived. Taking that as a threat, I immediately told her that I will call the police on her if she ever comes to my house. I hang up the phone call one last time, and blocked her number. I know she kept trying to call, and send texts to me since she sent me angry emails as well. But I never got back to her. Anyway, thank you for reading all the way to the end, and I hope it won't happen to you too. That's it for the video, thanks for watching.